check one and do. Okay. Oh, my heart, it's ours. Every time I think of you, Lord Things you said and done Give me life and peace and freedom There's nothing better than to walk with you All of my problems seem to disappear I'm never taking my eyes off you For you give me courage And remove the fear I'm yours and thankful You are mine How my life has changed since the day you came and saved me Now every day is brand new Life's become an awesome journey There's nothing better than to walk with you All of my problems seem to disappear I'm never taking my eyes off you For you give me coverage And remove the fear I'm yours and thankful you are mine Whether I live or die Whether I'm rich or poor Whether in health or in pain whether lonely or in a crowd I'm yours and thankful you are mine The future don't scare me Because I know you're there waiting for me Soon I'm going home I cannot wait to be in your presence There's nothing better than to walk with you All of my problems seem to disappear I'm never taking my eyes off you you give me courage and remove the fear I'm yours and thankful you are mine Whether I live or die Whether I'm rich or poor Whether in health or in pain Whether lonely or in a crowd I'm yours and thankful you are mine. All right, uh, good evening. Could you turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 3, verse 16? Daniel chapter 3, verse 16. Daniel chapter 3, verse 16. Uh, what I'll be doing is uh, when, I, uh, when we go to read the first 15 verses of the chapter, we'll be reading from my translation. So um, that's in my notes, of course. Uh, so uh, if you could be at Daniel chapter 3, verse 16, I have you there because we're going to be doing uh, studying that verse. We'll be studying where... Uh, in this verse where it says that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego tell Nebuchadnezzar that they are by no means obligated to respond 
to his rhetorical question. As we saw, he said, uh, Nebuchadnezzar said to them in verse 15, at the very end, uh, is there a God that, is, uh, that, uh, is able, that exists that is able to deliver you three out of my power? So he is defying the God of Israel, who of course is the God of Daniel, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and of course the same God that we worship, Jesus Christ. So that'll be our subject here uh, this evening. Uh, without further ado, let's take the moment of silent prayer to ensure the fact that we're filled with the Spirit, which is commanded of us in Ephesians 5.18. Uh, that uh, simply, uh, that command is uh, very much in line and synonymous with letting the Word of Christ richly dwell in our souls, Colossians 3.16 uh, the reason why is that both bear, produce the same results if you look at both passages. And also, of course, the Holy Spirit inspired the Scriptures, Second Peter 1, 20 and 21. And so, therefore, when you're obeying the Word of God, you're obeying the Holy Spirit because He inspired the Scriptures and He speaks to us through the Scriptures. So, the filling of the Spirit, the word plerello, which is uh, translated filled in Ephesians 5, 18, it speaks of being influenced by the Holy Spirit, having your soul controlled by Him. Of course, that's something you have to permit Him to to do. There's a permissive uh, passive in that uh, particular verb. So uh, this is a very important time when you're filled with the Spirit, uh, you're in fellowship with God, and uh, to the first step in getting in fellowship with God is confessing our sins, doing what First, uh, first John 1, 9 states, if we confess our sins to the Father, He, God the Father, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins with the result that He purifies us from each and every wrongdoing. So if there's anything that's bothering you or disturbing or distracting you at this time, do what First Peter 5, 7 says, Cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because he cares for you. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for another day to, to enjoy fellowship with you, to enjoy who and what you are and who your Son is in the Spirit and what you've done for us in the past through them, are doing for us now and will do for us in the future. Father, we thank you for uh, your work on our behalf in eternity past and electing us to the privilege of having a, a relationship and fellowship with you. We thank you, Father, for predestinating us to be conformed to the image of your Son. And we thank you for the, the gift of your Son, his willingness to become a human being and sacrificing him on behalf of us, all of us sinners. We thank you, Father, for treating us in grace and giving us the forgiveness of sins through your Son, Jesus Christ, and loving us while we were yet your enemy. And we just thank you for raising us up and seating us with your Son at your right hand through the baptism of the Spirit at the moment of our conversion, even when we were dead in our sins and transgressions, and treating us in grace. And so help us, Father, now that we're the recipients of grace and the object of your grace, help us to reflect uh, that grace and love toward each other and the members of the body of Christ, being kind and compassionate and tender-hearted and forgiving one another and uh, patient and tolerant of one another. We pray, Father, that, uh, that we continue to grow in this ministry and love toward you and each other. If you see fit, we pray that you would raise up in addition to those already in our ministry that would have positive volition and would serve and that would take an interest in the Word of God and uh, we just pray, Father, also uh, for this, for other ministries who are, which are faithful to your word. Uh, we also, uh, we thank you for the Thompsons opening up their home to us and their sacrifice. And we just thank you, Father, for all that they're doing, which you know all about. And uh, we will reward them uh, abundantly at some point at the rapture and the Bema seat. Uh, we just thank you for those who were listening on Pal Talk and through the website. We thank you for the technology so that we could uh, have fellowship with these uh, people, your brothers, my brothers and sisters in Christ that live in other parts of this country and the world. Uh, we thank you, Father, for the study in the book of Daniel. And uh, we just thank you, Father, for the things that we're learning about uh, Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in the midst of a, 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 a heathen society, uh, the Babylonian society, which was antagonistic to you. And uh, we just uh, thank you for the things that we're learning and how they were trusting in you, even though they were in a dangerous place, in a strange place, 
And even though their, their former way of life in Israel was gone and that they were in strange territory and yet they remained faithful to you and even courageous to you despite the odds, despite the fact that Nebuchadnezzar and, and the Babylonian government was against them and opposed to them, yet they did not bow down and capitulate and compromise. And uh, they did not give in to the devil's world. So we pray that you, we could learn the example from them and we realizing in the scriptures that uh, through this uh, study of your three servants here, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you don't need a great army. You can use a few good men and women who uh, love you and are faithful to you, and you could do mighty things. In fact, we've learned that you're glorified in sins, instances such as this, because then your, your power is manifested and is more uh, uh, manifest when, uh, and obvious to others when that takes place, when you ju use just a few. Uh, and we just pray, Father, that we could follow their example, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and of course, Daniel. We pray, Father, you help everyone in the audience to concentrate. We pray that you would give grace to myself so that I could teach your word in a fashion that would uh, bring glory to you and your son. And of course, instruct the body of Christ, uh, rebuke, reprove if necessary, uh, encourage the body of Christ, and, uh, and teach them about your ways and how you want them to conduct themselves so that uh, they can bring glory to you in, in their own daily lives. So, Father, we just pray that we'd also have no problems with the technology. We thank you for Titus and Tyler. We just pray that you would help them with the sound and the recordings and we'd have a, a great time fellowshipping in your word, uh, continuing to uh, learn more and more about your plan for our lives. So in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Daniel chapter 3, verse 16 is where you should all be. We're going to note... Uh, Daniel 3.16 here this evening, as I said a few moments ago. Uh, in this verse, we have the record of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, responding to Nebuchadnezzar's rhetorical question at the end of verse 15, which actually challenged the God of Israel's ability to deliver these three from the king's power. So what we're seeing, uh, Shad Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are actually uh, practicing justified civil disobedience. We've taught this in the past. Uh, there are times, uh, the Bible teaches us to obey God, of course, but it also tells us to obey the civil authorities. Paul talks about that in Romans 13. We studied that. 1 Peter 2 says the same thing. Uh, we see that uh, at times these, th these two things, uh, requirements of us, uh, our mandates of us, are come into conflict, and uh, sometimes the civil authorities uh, command us to disobey God. And we have an instance of that here, with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were told not to practice idolatry in the Mosaic Law and the Ten Commandments, and they were going to obey that. Of course, Nebuchadnezzar is telling them to bow down to this statue that he erected of himself, which was made of solid gold. Uh, in today's uh, to society, in our, in our, with the price of gold, that would probably be about $115 billion today. It was 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide, and he was a, 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 actually a statue of himself. And yet Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego against all, everybody there, everybody bowed down to the statue, but they refused to. Uh, they were, uh, that took faith. They had faith that, they, that what they would, that God wanted them to do what they did, and they were obedient to God. That gave them courage in the midst of tremendous adversity. And God's going to use just these three individuals to bring glory to himself. He's going to use Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, to actually evangelize Nebuchadnezzar and his government and the uh, members of his cabinet. And uh, remember, uh, he's a heathen. He's an unbeliever. So he's learned a little bit about uh, the God of Israel through Daniel in chapter 2. We saw that, that he's a revealer of mysteries. But he's now he's going to find out that Daniel's God and the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is actually a God who's omnipotent and is sovereign over Nebuchadnezzar. And that Nebuchadnezzar's success on the battlefield and politically was all, could be all attributed to the God of Israel, what Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2. The king is going to learn this. The king is going to get saved because of this incident with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He's going to end up praising the God of Israel. And only be uh, believers do that in the Bible. You never see an unbeliever praising the God of Israel like you do Nebuchadnezzar. And so he's going to come to a saving knowledge of, uh, of, of the God of Israel, Jesus Christ. And it's all because of these three individuals. They're, these three individuals, sh much like you and I, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, saved by the grace of God through faith in the Lord. Uh, there's nothing special about these guys. What makes them special is their, the fact that they were what God had done for them and what God had uh, and, and the things that they were doing 
uh, the decisions they were making uh, brought glory to God. Uh, God was in the, working through these three individuals, and God, as I pointed out in the prayer, uh, he doesn't need a massive army. He, all he needs is a courageous few. Uh, most ministries, if you talk to most uh, uh, pastors, the people who are doing the work of the Lord in a particular ministry, they're few and far between. They're very few and far between. Most people are uh, nod to God Christians. Uh, they're tumbleweed Christians. They bounce from church to church. Uh, most Christians today, uh, most Christians today, uh, don't care about the w- Word of God. They're not students of the Word of God, and they uh, and what's witnessed by the fact that they don't frequent churches where there are uh, the prop- uh, promoting the Word of God. If they if they did have a love for the uh, Word of God, they would be here. But we see. Uh, All these things is that believers today, majority of believers today, uh, are not doing the work of the Lord. It's a small few that are doing, that are carrying the burden. And those are the ones that are making the mark for God. Those are the ones that are making impact in society. So what we're learning through Daniel's three friends is that God doesn't need a massive army. This is taught throughout the Old Testament uh, to, to bring glory to himself, to bring victory uh, he he only he, he do, all he needs is a few uh, classic cake uh, classic cases in the book of Judges and Judges seven and eight and nine uh, Gideon he was actually a very coward uh, uh, not a courageous person he was basically a coward uh, but God used him and three hundred night rangers to uh, repel and to defeat one hundred eighty five thousand Midianites Arabs and he put they put them to flight and it was just them just uh, three hundred and one people. Uh, did that, and they set. Uh, they defeated 185,000, and then the rest came. Uh, rest of the tribes of Israel came in and uh, cleaned up, helped them clean up on the on the enemy. So God can just use a small few. Uh, look at the church, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ. It started off with a few disciples, twelve apostles. Yet they turned the world upside down. Uh, the, uh, God, they, that what they did, uh, the, this this small band of apostles, they turned the world upside down, and the world has never been the same since. Uh, so we see that God is always doing this because God can bring greater glory to Himself. When he does this, uh, that way, if there was a a, a, a huge majority uh, that's doing uh, that was positive and everything, then he wouldn't get as much glory. Uh, we would we would attribute the greatness to the church rather than to Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. But when a few are doing the work of the Lord, like the case with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God gets greater glory for Himself. So look at Dan- uh, if you look at Daniel chapter three verse one, uh, we're going to read uh, the first fifteen verses of the chapter. Through my translation, and my tra- translation reflects my interpretation of these verses, and then we'll work off the New American Standard in verse 16 here this evening. So uh, if you look at verse 1 in my translation, Daniel 3.1, <clears throat> it says, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, sculptured an image composed of gold, its height 90 feet, its width 9 feet, and he erected it on the plain of Dora in the province of the city of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king issued an order to assemble the satraps, the military commanders, as well as the governors, the advisors, treasurers, lawyers, judges, in other words, each and every one of the dignitaries from the provinces to attend the dedication of the statue which Nebuchadnezzar erected. Then, when the satraps, military commanders, as well as the governors, advisors, treasurers, lawyers, judges, in other words, Each and every one of the dignitaries from the provinces assembled for the dedication of the statue which Nebuchadnezzar the king had erected. They stood directly in front of the statue which Nebuchadnezzar had erected. Next, a herald publicly proclaimed with authority to all of you nations, ethnicities, and language groups. All of you are commanded at the precise moment when all of you hear the sound of the trumpet, the flute, the lyre, the harp, the dulcimer, the drum, as well as each and every type of musical instrument All of you must fall down in order to worship the gold statue which Nebuchadnezzar the king has erected. However, whoever refuses to fall down in order to worship in that very hour, they'll be deposited unceremoniously in the midst of a blazing fiery furnace. Because of this, at the precise moment when each and every one of the people from the nations heard the sound of the trumpet, the flute, the lyre, the harp, the dulcimer, as well as each and every type of musical instrument, Each and every one of the nations, ethnicities, language groups fell down worshiping the gold statue which Nebuchadnezzar the king had erected. Because of this, 
During this time, certain Chaldean men made assertions. Specifically, they slanderously accused some individuals from the Jewish race. They made a statement to the king and said, O king, live forever. You, O king, issued a command, namely that each and every person who hears the sound of the trumpet, the flute, the lyre, the harp, the dulcimer, as well as drum, and in addition, every type of musical instrument must fall down in order to worship the gold statue. However, whoever refuses to fall down in order to worship, they'll be deposited unceremoniously in the midst of a blazing fiery furnace. There are certain Jewish men, because you assign them the administration over the province of the city of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men have absolutely no respect for your commando king. By no means do they serve your God, that is, by no means do they worship the gold statue which you erected. Then, because of rage, yes, in a furious rage at that, Nebuchadnezzar issued an order causing Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be brought into his presence. Consequently, these men were brought into the king's presence. Nebuchadnezzar asked a question and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all of you are refusing to serve my God? That is, all of you refuse to worship the gold statue which I erected? Now, if all of you are ready, namely, that at the precise moment when all of you hear the sound of the trumpet, the flute, the lyre, the harp, the dulcimer, the drum, as well as each and every type of musical instrument, all of you must fall down in order to worship the gold statue which I erected. However, if all of you refuse to fall down in order to worship in that very hour, all of you will be deposited unceremoniously in the midst of a blazing fiery furnace. Now, let's see what God exists who has the ability to effect the rescue of all of you out of my power. Now, verse 16 says in the New American Standard, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this, matters, this matter. Now, the word we there, when it says, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter, the word we there is the word anachna. Anachna is a word that sir, it means we. It's referring, of course, to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And it's interesting about this word, this word anachna, it serves to contrast Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego with God. Why? Well, it's serving to contrast God with these three men who refused to answer the king's rhetorical question since only God could answer this question. Nebuchadnezzar's question, now let's see what God exists who has the ability to effect the rescue of all of you out of my power. When he, they say we, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're contrasting themselves with God because only God is going to be able to answer this question. It's up to God to decide if he's going to demonstrate his great power before the king. And he does, of course. So thus, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are, in effect, telling the king that they won't answer, but their God will. Their God, the God of Israel, Daniel's God, God will give him an answer to his rhetorical question, which challenged God's ability to deliver them from his power. What Nebuchadnezzar is going to find out is what the Philippian jailer found out. Uh, remember the Philippian jailer who got saved uh, as, as a result of Paul evangelizing and as a result of God uh, uh, causing an earthquake which uh, uh, caused the prisoners to be uh, uh, released from their bonds and yet the, uh, the jailer was going to kill himself and uh, Paul stepped in and they said, don't kill yourself. And the jailer said, what, sirs, must I do to be saved? And he said, believe on the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. Your household to do the same as well. So we see that these three guys, Nebuchadnezzar, like the Philippian jailer, is going to find out that not only does God deliver physically from death and disease and all kinds of things, in this particular instance, death. He's the God who saves from a greater danger to the human race, eternal condemnation and sin and Satan. So he's going to learn uh, that God is an omnipotent God and he has the power to save not only from physical harm, but also to save from spiritual death. And so we see here that they're telling the king with this word, they're saying that the king, we, in contrast to God, uh, we don't we're not obligated to respond to you. God is going to answer you, your question. So we see the, the phrase, do not need, when they say, we do not need to give you an answer, Concerning this matter, the phrase, do not need, is two words in the Aramaic 
We have the negative particle law. It's a familiar word we've seen. It's negating the meaning of the verb, the pe'al participle form of the verb kashach, which is translated here, do need. Now, the verb means to need, to be necessary, to feel obligated. And again, its meaning is emphatically negated by the negative particle law. And the negative particle is a particle of emphatic negation. So it's not just not. It's by no means. It's stronger. So therefore, what these two words are telling us is that they denote that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are telling Nebuchadnezzar that they are by no means, uh, they by no means need to, or by no means find it necessary, or we could say they are by no means obligated to answer the king's rhetorical question, which challenged God's ability to deliver them from the king's power. They're saying it's not up to us to answer you, king, on that question. God's going to do that. Now, when it says to give an answer, it's a prepositional phrase composed of the preposition la, translated here to, and its object is the haf el, uh, infinitive construct form of the verb tube, which is translated here, give an answer. So, and then we have with it, we have the second person uh, singular pronominal suffix ch, which is translated here, you, and that's referring, of course, to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, the verb there, tube, it means to answer, it's correctly translated, it means to respond on to, uh, to someone, and it denotes that these three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are telling the king that by no means are they obligated to respond or to answer his rhetorical question, which again challenged God's ability to deliver them out of the king's power. Now, when it says concerning this matter, uh, that's referring, uh, what is that referring? Well, first of all, we have, it's another prepositional phrase. It's pre the preposition al, and it's, uh, then we have the word de na, translated this, and then we have the word pithkam, which is translated here matter. Now, what is it referring to, this prepositional phrase, concerning this matter? Is he talking about uh, the king uh, repeating his command and the, res the consequences of disobeying it? Or is he talking about the rhetorical question? Or is he talking about all three here? What is that phrase concerning this matter referring to? Because it's it we want to know what Nab uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are referring to and what are they talking about that they don't feel like they have to answer. Uh, you know, it's, it, they're, not, they're not disobeying uh, they're not being flipped with the king or disrespectful to him. They're actually being very honest and upfront with him. It, it, see, the English text, and uh, unless you're ex ex you can see it and it, it, it can explain it, what we see here is that they're speaking to it, when they, this phrase concerning this matter, it's speaking to the rhetorical question. It's not speaking to what you know, the king repeated his command and the warning of the consequences of disobeying him. So when they say concerning this matter, they're not specifically speaking of, of, the, uh, the, of the command, the re repetition of the command by the king in the warning, but it's primarily dealing with the, the uh, rhetorical question. Now, the word matter there, pithgam, as I said before, it, it's correctly translated. It means matter in the sense of the subject under consideration, which is Nebuchadnezzar's rhetorical question. Now, why is it Nebuchadnezzar's rhetorical question? Why? Ask questions. Why? Because when I looked at this, I go, okay, what, 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 what is he talking about? And if, if it's the rhetorical question, why isn't it his, uh, his command, the repetition of his command, and the warning again? Or all three. Why is it speaking of the rhetorical question? Well, it does not refer to the king's question in verse 14, in which he asked Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if it was true, they refused to worship the gold statue. Uh, look at verse 14 in my interpreted translation. <clears throat> it says in verse 14, Nebuchadnezzar asked a question and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all of you were refusing to serve my God, that is, all of you re who refused to worship the gold statue which I erected? So when he says in verse 16, concerning this matter, we don't have to answer to you, Nebuchadnezzar, or we're not obligated, uh, we're by no means obligated. Does the phrase concerning this matter refer to that question? Well, it doesn't, and why? Well, it, it, well, I'll tell you in a moment. Verse 15, does it refer to the king's command in verse 15 to worship the gold statue at the sound of the music or the ultimatum that's found in this verse to worship it or die? Look at uh, verse 15. Now, if all of you are ready, namely, that at the precise moment when all of you hear the sound of the trumpet, the flute, the lyre, the harp, the dulcimer, the drum, as well as each and every type of musical instrument, all of you must fall down in order to worship the gold statue which I erected. 
However, if all of you refuse to fall down in order to worship in that very hour, all of you will be deposited unceremoniously in the midst of a blazing fiery furnace. Now let's now stop there. That's a warning and a command. So when he says concerning this matter, we don't feel obligated, we're by no means obligated, King, in verse 16, to, uh, to uh, answer you in this matter. Well, is it refer to that? The command and the repetition doesn't. It doesn't. Rather, what it's actually referring to is again the king's question in which he challenges the gods, God of Israel's ability to deliver them from the king's power. Why? Well, verse 18, in verse 18, the very next verse, this is where you pay attention to context. They tell the king that they will by no means worship the gold statue. So that would answer the king's question if it was re re true that they refused to worship the gold statue and it would also serve to answer the king's command and the ultimatum. However, they don't speak for God with regards to the rhetorical question. So it, as we read in, those, in verses 14 and 15, look at verse 18. Because verse 18 actually gives Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's response to Nebuchadnezzar's statements and question and statements and warnings in verses 14 and 15. Look at it says in verse 18. But even if he does not, meaning deliver us, it, let it be known to you, O king, that we are, no, are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So that tells the king, no, we're not going to, yes, it's true, verse 14, yes, it's true, we disobeyed you. It's also answering the king's uh, response, a repetition of the command and the warning. You're right, we're not going to go and worship this golden statue. We're not going to do it. So that leaves uh, the phrase concerning this matter in verse 16 to refer to the rhetorical question. Because what they're saying is, we can't answer that. We're, no, we're not obligated, by no means obligated to answer you, king. But they just, so we know, when they're saying that, when it says, if you look at verse 16, O Nebuchadnezzar, as for us, we're by no means obligated to respond to you concerning this matter. What matter? The question. Because we know it's not this, the question in verse 14. It's not the statement in verse 15 and the warning. It's the rhetorical question. Because he, in verse 18, as we read, those three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they answer the king, what he asked them in verse 14, is it true that you won't worship the statue? And then they also respond to his uh, repetition of the command and the warning for uh, if they don't obey the command. So verse 18 records them answering those things. But no, So what are they talking about here in verse 16? What matter we're not going to answer you on? The question, Why? Because they're saying, let God answer for himself if he sees fit. If, you know, Because the king's saying, is there a God that exists that can deliver you out of my power? I, you you got to understand what Nebuchadnezzar is thinking. He's a heathen. He thinks that Israel's God is not as strong as his God. How does he get that idea? This is where you got to go back and understand the historical background. Nebuchadnezzar and the people of that day, you, they thought if in one country conquers another country, the gods that people worship that's the conquering country have defeated the con uh, those who are conquered. So when, they, when Nebuchadnezzar defeated Israel and took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel into captivity, he's looking at Yahweh, the God of Israel, as weak and that his God has defeated Israel's God. That's what they, It's a battle of the gods. But what Nebuchadnezzar is going to find out, and, he, and God was uh, trying to talk to him through Daniel chapter 2, is that Nebuchadnezzar... I'm in control of you. I'm in control of the whole thing. I allowed you to do that. I'm in control. I raised you up. Jeremiah 27 says that. I raised you up, Nebuchadnezzar, to do this. And in fact, Daniel said that to him in Daniel 2, 37 and 38. You're the head of gold. I've given you this authority and success and power and military conquest. You're, you're a world ruler right now because of me. And so this is all to bring glory to me and also to discipline my people, Israel, and these other nations surrounding them. So God is in control, and that Nebuchadnezzar's thinking, there's nobody, because every nation I've conquered, nobody's able to been able to defeat me. No one can stop me. So he's thinking, how in the world are these three punks, you know, who I promoted, I promoted these guys out of the goodness of my heart, out of Daniel's request, and now they betray me and are disloyal to me, and who do they think they are? Really, do they really think that their God is stronger, uh, strong enough to, def uh, to, def uh, to overpower me? Because nobody's gods have been able to defeat me, Babylon. And so I know he's a revealer of mysteries. 
Daniel showed me that. I respect that. But come on. When the push comes to shove, I'm the man. Uh, nobody can defeat me. Nobody can defeat me. And so who are these guys? These guys are, are crazy. He can't believe that they would risk their lives out of obedience to their God. And they're going to find out why they do this and why they love their God so much to the point of death and were obedient to their God to the point of death. Nebuchadnezzar is going to find out why these guys love their God so much and are so obedient to him, which manifests the fact that they love their God. So he's going to find out why. So when it says concerning this matter in verse 16, he's re referring to the rhetorical question. So we see here that, uh, again, when it says concerning this matter, matter, it's a direct reference to the king's rhetorical question in which he challenged the God of Israel's ability to deliver them from the king's power because in verse 18, we just read, they tell the king that they're by no means going to worship the gold statue. This answers the king's question if it was true that they refused to worship the gold statue and it also serves to answer the king's command and ultimatum. However, they don't speak for God with regards to the rhetorical question. Instead, they're telling the king that they're by no means obligated to respond to this question. In other words, the implication is we will let God speak for himself. The, if God chooses to, Nebuchadnezzar, our God, if he chooses to answer you and deliver us, then that's his choice. But we're not going to do this. We're not going to speak for him and say, yeah, he's going to deliver us. Okay? So they're not presuming on God, which is a very important thing we'll learn in here this evening. Now, uh, if, uh, in my translation of this verse, verse 16, and then I want to bring out some points about this verse. It says in verse 16, my translation, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, as for us, we, and then we could say in contrast to God, we are by no means obligated to respond to you concerning this matter. What matter? The rhetorical question at the end of verse 15. Is there a God who exists who can deliver you guys out of my power? So, verses 16 through 18 of Daniel chapter 3 contain the response of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to what Nebuchadnezzar said to them as recorded in verses 14 and 15. Now, as we saw in verse 14, Nebuchadnezzar asked them if it's true that they refused to obey his command and worship the gold statue which he erected. Then in verse 15, he repeats to them his command that they must worship the gold statue at the sound of the music. Following this command, in verse 15, as we read, he also repeats the ultimatum to worship the image or suffer capital punishment. Lastly, at the end of verse 15, he poses to them a rhetorical question that demanded a negative response from his perspective. And it challenged the God of Israel's ability to deliver these three from his power. Now, in verse 16, we've, we've studied... We have the response of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to the king's rhetorical question. And then we, as we read a little bit earlier tonight, in verse 18, they respond to the, his question in verse 14, as well as the command and the ultimatum in verse 15, by telling the king that they were by no means going to worship this gold statue. And of course, this was out of obedience to their God who prohibited the practice of idolatry. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are refusing to compromise and demonstrate absolutely no fear of the king or death. They are not afraid of the king or death. What they do fear and respect more than anything is their God. They're living to please their God. And again, their obedience is out of love, they're out of love for God. Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So a test of our love is obedience. Uh, we see this with Abraham, I pointed out. Abraham's a classic case of that. God said to sacrifice your, your beloved son Isaac, which was actually a picture of the father and the son. And we saw that God had no intention of letting uh, Abraham kill his son, and who was about in his 30s at that particular point. Instead, he interceded and he provided a sacrifice, just like uh, Abraham said prophetically to I Isaac, the Lord will provide the sacrifice. And so we see that Abraham obeying God was more important than even his own, own love for his own son. Now this, listen to me, and I've, I've, I don't know how many times I've taught on this principle. This is something the church needs to hear in, the, in America and around the world always. 
It's something we have to ask ourselves. Are we willing to be obedient to God even if it costs us legitimate things? Because Jesus taught this in the gospel. You can't really be my disciple unless you, unless you love me more than human, other human relationships and possessions and things. This is something that happens in the gospels, as I've been pointing out, where a rich man goes to Jesus and says, I'll follow you. Uh, you know, and, and you know, Jesus says, you know, sell your possessions and give them to the poor and, uh, and then you know, follow me. And he went away sad because he was rich because money and possessions was keeping him from following Jesus wholeheartedly. Uh, a, remember the dead? He said, let the dead bury the dead. Guy said, I'll follow you, Jesus. Jesus said, follow me. He says, well, let me fo- bury my father. Now, Jesus wasn't saying dishonor your father, not bury him. What he was saying, he understood this guy because he's God. He understood that this guy's problem was human relationships. Uh, his his uh, family relationships were keeping him from following Jesus wholeheartedly. Uh, one of the things that sets the apostles apart, we sit there and we criticize a lot of times the apostles, and rightly so for many things. But one thing you can't say, you can't, even Peter puts his foot in his mouth and all that, right? He does a lot of stupid things. But listen to me. Peter and John and James, they left their fishing businesses to follow Jesus. They left their families to follow Jesus. Think about that. Think about that. They've left everything to follow him. They made big sacrifices. And Peter pointed that out. Lord, we left behind everything to follow you. And Jesus said, that's right. And you'll be rewarded. And he also said, along with persecutions. So the apostles loved Jesus. Uh, They were willing to give up everything uh, to follow him. And so Abraham was willing to sacrifice the, the most beloved person on the earth to him outside of Sarah in order to obey God. So uh, what we see here is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they don't love their lives. They, they understand something that we need to understand, that we should obey our God even if it costs us our lives because everything we have, every possession, every relationship in our life, every job, the businesses we have, the cars, the trucks, everything we have, the kids, the wives, the hu- husbands, the families, all these things are given to us by God. And therefore, we should love the blesser rather than the blessings. Yet we have the opposite going on, which is idolatry in the church and spiritual adultery. God demands, Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, demands total allegiance. He wants us to love love him to the point of death if it costs us our lives. Now listen to me. We don't have that situation in our country. uh, Christians are dying out of obedience to God and identification with Jesus and the Bible in many parts of the world. But in our country, uh, the people are not being put to death for following Jesus, at least not yet. So what, but what can we learn then? Because how is that, this going to apply to us, what we're learning about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that obedience to God was more important than their own lives? Well, it's going to teach us something. We might not have our lives threatened by obeying God. However, there are things in our lives that we, have, that we could do and are legitimate things and we could spend time with like family and friends or take a certain job or do, uh, you know, uh, do things for ourselves that are not sin in itself, but legitimate things. Take that job, take that promotion, yet it's not God's will. And, uh, and we need to understand that, uh, that we can very well fall into the trap that Satan sets up where we could fall in love with the things of the world and even human relationships that are legitimate and we, we're not obe- and, and, and what suffers is our obedience to God. We don't go to the church that we've been called to. We don't sit under the pastor who we've been called to, assigned to. And we don't uh, serve in the church that we have because other things are more important. We don't love him. Uh, we, if we, if we, how are we going to ever uh, love Jesus to the point of death when our lives, if our lives are ever threatened when we can't love him uh, more than the possessions and families and friends and things that we have and jobs that we have in our own life right now. If, if, we, if, we're, if we're not uh, obedient to him in this smaller area, in these areas where our lives are not non-life-threatening non-life, situations, what are we going to be like if our lives are threatened? And I've been bringing out what well, the way you are now is how you're going to be when, you, when your life is threatened because God prepare, prepare, prepares you. So, you, I mean, we can't even, we got to get, you know, when people, you know, uh, when people make decisions, it first and foremost, 
Is it going to take me away from the word of God? Is it going to keep me from obeying God? And people don't make decisions like that many times in the church. They, what they think about is the, Christian, the church and their, where they're, they're following, you know, operating in their gift, learning the Bible, putting it into practice. That becomes second fiddle for a lot of people. And that ought not to be the case. Jesus died for us. We're obligated, but first of all, not just obligated, we should, we should want to give our whole selves to him because he saved us from eternal condemnation. He saved us from our sins and Satan. Why couldn't we? Why, we should be loving him in response to that to the point where we'll give up our own lives. We'll, we'll say no to the uh, uh, re relationships that are wrong. We will say no to jobs that will keep us away from the plan of God. We will say no to uh, uh, um, money or the things of the world that could keep us from obeying God. See, this is what happened in Israel. Uh, you know, they, the, the, God said, don't compromise with the Canaanites. You'll worship their gods and you'll cheat on me. You'll commit spiritual adultery. And therefore, that's what God's telling us. You know, we, you know, we have a lot of things in our society, and let's talk about America, where we have so many things that are entertainment, uh, sports, music, uh, money, businesses, homes. We got so many, this American life is so crazy and fast paced and we get so blinded by what really matters in life, which is learning God's word, obeying it, obeying it, which demonstrates you love Jesus. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So, you know, we don't have life-threatening situations going on in our country today for Christians out of obeying God, obeying God. No one's getting killed or being thrown into prison and suffering capital punishment like these three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, for obeying God at this point in this country. But what if it happens? And right now, and if that does happen, we prepare ourselves for that moment by now not letting anything, not even family keep us from obeying God. And now I have to balance this because there's always some crazy people out there. I'm not saying you should forsake your responsibilities to your family. I'm not saying that. God wants you to obey, uh, take care of your family. That he's commanded you to do that. It's called priorities. It's priorities. You know, it's priorities. All comes down to what's important to you. And what, what's important to you is reflected in how you spend your money. It's reflected on how you spend your time. And let me, that, let's just take that. Forget about money. Let's just take about the most precious thing that God's given us, time. And the bodies he's given us. And the mind he's given us, time. That's precious. That's the most valuable thing that you have, more valuable than your, your bank account. Now, how do we use our time? How much time do we devote to prayer and study? I know you get a job. I know you get all this stuff. Everybody. But I'm saying, what do you do outside of that? I got a wife and kids. I know you have a wife and kids. <laughs> How much time do you set aside for God? See, these are tough things because those are the, these are the decisions that you make as a Christian that are, have eternal ramifications. It's going to determine whether you're an overcomer and receive rewards at the Bema Seat and glorify God in time or not. It's the decisions we make and the priority. See, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, before they ever got to this stage where they were going to obey God, even at a point that it's going to cost them their lives, God had prepared them for that moment. And also, they made positive decisions leading up to this moment. They were ready. They had made good decisions all the way through. We saw that in chapter 1. They were still obeying God in the dietary regulations, while every other Jewish exile was not. They were the only four that made a stand, Daniel and the street friends. We see, him, we see them in chapter 2. They have a prayer meeting. No other Jewish exiles but those four. Daniel goes to those three to intercede and prayer for him to God. Okay? Then you get to chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Without Daniel in the picture, their lives are threatened. They stand for God. They made a decision. We're going to obey God, even if it costs us our lives. So what we can learn from them, though we're not in a life-threatening situation for obeying God in this country, what we can learn is we need to make our minds up that we're going to obey God, and obeying God is more important than 
anything, including even our beloved family members. You have to make that decision, people. And some people never... See, one of the things I've, I've seen is that a lot of things, the most dangerous, the most, most powerful thing that keeps people away from following God, and this is reflected in the Gospels, the following Jesus wholeheartedly, is relationships. Human relationships are more important to people. I don't know how many people, I, I can think of probably, probably one couple in my life who I married, and they actually increased coming to Bible class. They were in fact, much more, and they're sitting in front of me, and I'm teaching in their house. But I can't think of any other people I've married who, were, who actually increased their intake of the Word of God and showed up to class more. Instead, usually everybody goes and drifts away. Now, I blame men when it comes to that. I don't blame the ladies as much. They're to blame. They, they have their own decisions. But I blame the men for that because the men are supposed to be the leaders in the relationship. So a man, if he's a godly man, he makes it a point saying, honey, we got to go to Bible class. You know, be a, a Christian man that sh- and lead. And very few Christian men are doing that. They're being led around by their wives. That's true. Now, why do I bring that up? Because some, fam- some families will not follow God wholeheartedly, won't follow Jesus wholeheartedly, won't be committed because their love, their love for their families and their husbands and wives or kids is more important than following after God. Is there something wrong with loving your husband and wife? No. Nothing wrong with that. Anything wrong with that? No. What's, in, what's the, the bad thing is you're putting those husband and wife and kids ahead of Jesus. You know? And so I brought up the apostles. They left behind everything to follow him. So we got it. We got to, what I'm telling you is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego made a choice. And let me tell you something. It's not easy, people. It's not easy to make these choices. It's not. I'd be, if I sat up here, and stood up here, and, and I told you, oh, it's so easy. No, it is so hard. Do you think, you know, you think Abraham didn't battle as he was trudging up that mountain? <laughs> as he's trudging up Mount Moriah, you don't think he was in a fight mentally? Of course he was. He's just like us. Think about that if you were him. Of course you were. We look at Abraham and we think, you know, he never he had battles. We all do. And God knows that. But he wants to see if he's testing our obedience, our faith. You know, what comes before obedience is a reflection of if we trust him. You know, another thing, reason why people don't follow wholeheartedly after Jesus and are committed to him and are sold out for him is that they don't trust him. They don't think that he'll take care of them. So it's it's look at it, it's very Hard make these decisions, and uh, hey, I, I I brought this out from times past, and forgive me for, for mentioning it. I just bring it out as an illustration because I don't know, I, you know, I don't know. I think it's important to bring I bring it out, and so that you know that I understand how difficult these decisions are, and I'm not telling you to do something that first that God has not told me to do, and I have done. I mean, when I I, I brought this out in the past, I I was the only woman I've ever loved in my life. Only woman, I'm 50 years old, only one I ever liked in my life, I, 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 I broke up with her because, one, she didn't love God, uh, and she didn't love the Word of God, and I did. And I wanted to follow after Jesus. I wanted to learn the Bible. I wanted to go to Dallas Theological Seminary. I ended up going to Bob McLaughlin's ministry, which turned out great. I got to serve in that ministry, but she didn't want to come with me. I had a choice to make. Do I, is my love for her, come, is that go ahead of my obedience to God. I know God said, you got to keep going. You got to go and follow me. And he was trying to get, either she comes with you willingly or she wants to come, and she didn't. And I know I had to make a choice. And it took me two years at least before I could do that, before I could say, it's over. And it broke my heart. There's other things. Coming to Iowa was another big 10 years, uh, over 10 years later. I had my little nephew. Uh, he was younger than Tyler. And all my, my, they're all young, and now they're all older in college. Now one's in graduate school, the older one. Well, the older one, Andrew, my brother's kid, I'm his godfather. And he was, uh, you know, I remember the night before I was going to go. I was over at my parents' house, and he was crying. Why do you have to go? I was close to that kid. What do I do? Do I, 
Do I stay because of the tears of, a, of, a, of an eight-year-old? That's hard. I said, no, I'm, I'm going to go. I got to do this. I told him, Andrew says, you know, it's not like I'm dead. I'm going to die. I'm still around. I'll, I'll be around. I'll be back. And, you know, I can talk to you on the phone. And, you know, I, I'm going to go because God wants me to go there. And I had the conviction that he wanted me to go. And I went. And if I, and if, and, and you know, I, I thought about this, if I had the choice over again with the, um, you know, the, uh, you know, with the church, knowing that the, if I knew before that the church split would take place, would I still have gone? I, of course I would have still have gone. Absolutely. So I had to make up my, my mother's tears, my father's tears. How do you, I, how do you, you have to make up your mind, I'm following you. Jesus was more important than my, my nephew Andrew. Doesn't mean I don't love him. More important than my mother and father. Doesn't mean I don't love them. But I love Jesus more. Now, forgive me for saying that. I just bring that up because I want you to know it ain't easy. And I've been through the road. And you probably could have your decisions that you made too. You know, but following after God, you know, we, you know there are people who make those decisions and then the people who don't make those decisions make the wrong decisions. Well, like especially with marriage. They, go to, they, 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 they get married and then the first thing that suffers is coming to Bible class. So we've got to make up our minds like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that we're committed to him. You know, um, let me show you this. Jesus talks about this. Look at Luke's gospel. Look at Luke 14. We got to count the cost. Got to count the cost. Don't say, I'm after you. I, I can, I've had so many people come up to me, oh, Pastor Bill, this is so, I, I could tell you, if I had, I'd be a rich man right now. You're the best teacher I've ever, ever had. You're, I mean, unbelievable. I mean, I heard people say, the very same people who said that, I used to say to myself, yeah, we'll see where you are five, five years from now. Was I being a pessimistic? No, I'm not pessimistic. I just know how people are. I know the sin nature. I've been taught this. I was warned this. I've seen it. I know how people are. They love you one minute and they hate you the next. Or they, they, they yeah, a lot of it, it had nothing to do with hate. Maybe it's just because things happen. And, it, and next thing they know, they're not in the ministry anymore. They didn't count the cost. They thought to come, uh, join in my, our ministry was, you know, just like, you know, oh, I'll show up like, you know, like the Catholics do and a lot of denominations do and do the nod to God. I show up to 20 minutes, I'm out of here. You know, I'm, I'm clean. Oh, I'm saved by grace. I'm forgiveness of sin. I believe in Jesus Christ as my Savior. But they're not his disciples. They're saved, going to heaven, but they're not committed to him. Most Christians are like that. It's like, oh, I'm going to heaven, I'm saved. And they're a bumper sticker Christians, you know. You know, they, they talk a lot, big game, but yet they're not committed. You can always tell if they're committed to Jesus. Do they do what Jesus tells them to do? Do they come to the church? Do they listen to the word of God? Do they listen to the pastors that he has delegated authority to to communicate the word of God? Are they using their spiritual gift? Are they giving of their time, talent, and treasure? Are they being good stewards with the time, talent, and treasure that God has given them? And if they're not, you know, come on. I mean, they, they, they are not making, most people are not making the right decisions. They're not counting the cost. They didn't, see, they like to give 10%. They, this is what Christians do today. They compartmentalize Bible class or par, compartmentalize Jesus because we teach his, you know, Bible class is teaching his word. Jesus is the word of God, right? Well, they compartmentalize it. This is what I do on Sunday morning and then the rest of the week I do whatever I want. You know, Jesus got his time right here and I got all this other time. It's not a part of their lives. They didn't, they're not, they, they, they've counted the, they've, they said, I'm not going to follow after them. So we got to, they, they, they have seen what it is, the commitment, and they're not willing to make the commitment. We have to count the cost to follow Jesus. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they counted the cost, and they found it absolutely imperative that they obey God, even if it cost them their lives. They counted the cost. They were willing to make that sacrifice. And to them, it wasn't a sacrifice it was because of love. I'm going to obey you, Lord, because I love you. Look at Luke 14, 25. Luke 14, 25. Now, large crowds were going along with him. Don't miss that. A lot of people followed Jesus, 
But it was for basically the entertainment that Jesus provided for them. And I'm not saying that Jesus was entertaining people. What I'm saying is they just follow him around because he could feed them. <laughs> He's doing wild miracles. I mean, he was a show for a lot of people. I'm following, they were following him for that reason. But the minute is, you know, when it comes to challenge them, the people fall away because his demands were total commitment to him. And most people weren't willing to do it. Now, now remember, to follow Jesus at that time, you were, he was an outlaw at that point. You know, he got to a point in his ministry where they were, they were going to assassinate him. Everybody knew it. To identify with Jesus as a Jew meant you got kicked out of the synagogue. And then you lost everything. Business, everything. Your kids could marry the other Jewish kids. It, it cost you something to follow Jesus back then. Verse 25, now large crowds were going along with him and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Carrying your cross meant death. They all knew what that meant. It meant suffering, ignominy, uh, uh, shame, death, suffering. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were willing to make that choice to suffer for him if needed. Look at verse 28. For which one of you? Now here's where you have to count the cost. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego counted the cost to following the Lord. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Oh, what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his possessions. Therefore, Now, what does he mean by that? I mean, all the possessions he ha they have? He's talking about, don't let all these possessions keep you from following me. You can keep your house, Peter. You can, they all did. They had this, the fishing businesses still. Remember when they, after the resurrection, they went back to fishing. No, what he's saying is, don't let these things keep you away from following me. Don't let your possessions stop you from following me. Look, it says in verse 34. Therefore, salt is good, but even if salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So he's saying, count the cross. And I brought you there because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did that. They would count the cost. They made up their mind to follow the Lord, even if it cost them their lives. And that's what I'm, t the church, what I'm saying to the church is that we need to do the same. We need to make these decisions and count the cost and follow after him. Now, we see here, as we close, that, uh, that Nebuchadnezzar, that uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have demonstrated total and absolute confidence in God, even if he decides not to deliver them from the king's power, as indicated by their statements in verses 17 and 18. Look at Daniel 2, uh, Daniel chapter 3. Look at verse 17, please. I love this. We'll see this in more detail tomorrow. This is, uh, this is great. This talks about their great faith how much they trusted him. Daniel, two, uh, Daniel 3, 17. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we're not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Even if he doesn't, we're going to still obey you. Man, that, he, that's what set him off. These guys are crazy. They're fanatics. That's right. You know where fanatic comes from? Fan. They're fans of the Lord. So we see that Nebuchadnezzar's question in verse 14, as well as his repeating the command and ultimatum in verse 15 to obey his command or suffer capital punishment, and in addition, his rhetorical question at the end of Daniel 3.15, were all designed, this is very important, they were all designed to uh, attempt Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to rationalize their own safety. Remember I talked about this last week? Christian, Christians rationalize why they don't have to obey God. That's a dangerous thing we got to watch out. Our sin nature is like that. The devil, 
you know, we, we rationalize. Uh, I'll give you a good example. A little quick. So, uh, some, uh, there was a situation where, um, and I was being told by, even by other pastors that I should do this. Uh, there was uh, somebody had uh, uh, fraud, uh, defrauded me of a lot of money. So they were saying, you know, thousands of dollars. And they're like saying, uh, you should take him to court. Now, Paul said to the Corinthians, he rebuked them in 1 Corinthians 6 for doing that. He said, why don't you just suffer, why don't you suffer loss? It means you take the hit instead of bringing it to a secular judge and showing the whole world that the Christian church can't resolve their own problems in-house and embarrass the cause of Christ and bring shame to the cause of Christ. So I, 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 had, I even had a pastor tell me I should go sue him. I said, I can't do that. Look at Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6. But it was very easy to rationalize it away that I should do this because that's the worldly way to do it. Take him to court. Get those son of a guns, right? Well, I couldn't do that because I had to make, and, and it wasn't easy, but you have to make that decision. I, I, was, I didn't want to rationalize why I, 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 couldn't, I didn't have to obey what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6. Don't, you be, shouldn't be suing your fellow Christians. Okay? So you have to, it was very easy to relax, rationalize that away. So I'm telling you, be careful of that. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are a good lesson for us to follow. They don't rationalize why they shouldn't have to obey God in order to seek their own safety. So the king, it's interesting, he's intimidating him here. The king knew human nature and that most men would compromise their save their lives. Most people have, don't have the moral courage and the conviction uh, to stand up and, and say, no, I won't compromise. Also, the king was trying to intimidate them and demoralize them and question their faith. He was trying to qu- get them to question their faith in God so that they had no other recourse but to obey him. However, they felt, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego felt it was more important to obey God and manifest their faith in him to all of Babylon, including Nebuchadnezzar, than to seek their own safety. So their obedience to God is more important than their powerful and prestigious position in Babylonian society, which they will lose along with their lives for refusing to obey the king's order. It's going to cost them their prestigious jobs. I mean, they are the administration over the province of Babylon. You couldn't, that's a big job. They're going to lose it all. And that, not to mention their lies. So they don't, this is very important. I'll come to the close here. They don't love the things of the world, which is commanded of every Christian in 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17. We're not to love the things of the world more than our, our obedience to God, more than God. They were of the conviction, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were of the conviction that executing the Lord's will is more important than anything the cosmic system could tempt them with or give them. These three friends will not be seduced away from obedience to God and doing His will by what Babylonian society could give them, which is driven by Satan's standards. So the question is to the Church of America and the United States of America in the 21st century in this day and age, is obedience to God more important than what American dream can give you? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would challenge us, instruct us, rebuke us, reprove us if necessary. We pray that this message might transform members of the body of Christ, that it might take root and would be watered. And we pray that it had brought glory to you. And we thank you, Father, for giving us this great privilege of studying your word and learning about how you want us to conduct our lives in the midst of the devil's world. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.